I'd like us to turn our attention to what we've got here in these verses and especially uh, what we've got in its context in verse 27 through 29. Elijah, just to go back a step, Elijah, you, you will remember, ha has been feeling very poorly and uh, been very discouraged. Uh, he, he had felt as if his ministry had come to nothing. And so it was as if he looked back on it and he said, well, I've done all these things. What fruit is there of it? What evidence is that uh, my work has been profitable? Well, in, as you think of him under the juniper tree and how the Lord dealt with him, now you see him here uh, bringing the word of God to Ahab. Uh, you can't help but notice how merciful uh, it is of God that he should give him an assurance that his work had been profitable. And uh, when, he come, when it comes to Elijah uh, and Ahab here in this passage, as Elijah comes with the word of God, it's like as if God's saying to him, uh, Elijah, do you see what I see? Look at Ahab. Can you see how he's humbling himself before me? Don't miss this, Elijah. This too is an effect of my word which you have faithfully brought to Israel and to him now. And uh, I, th I think that's quite important and uh, very significant. Now we're going to see as we go on that uh, this was not a saving work uh, in Ahab's life. But one thing's for sure, the word of God that Elijah brought bore fruit and had an effect. And that effect is very significant. You see, there are very important, solemn and encouraging truths here for us. And uh, we should always remember, as Isaiah 55 verse 11 puts it, that whenever God's word is faithfully brought and proclaimed, that the word of God that goes out of his mouth shall not return unto him void. Void there means having no power in it and having done nothing, not achieved its purpose. But rather, the, the word that goes out, out of the mouth of the Lord shall accomplish that, he says, for which I please. For which I please, says God. And it shall prosper into the thing whereunto I sent it. And so when you see Ahab going softly, this is the word of God at work. And Elijah uh, has this held before him, and it is an evidence that his work is indeed bearing fruit. So Elijah is being taught and reminded like we need to be as well, that there is more than one effect of the word of God when he sends it forth into the world. There are saving effects, thank God, there are saving effects where people are genuinely converted. But there are also, importantly, non-saving effects as well. Both are the prospering of the word in the thing whereunto God sent it. And Ahab is a prime example of this, and, and so we're going to look at him this afternoon. We've been following Elijah through, and uh, we've been following his ministry through. Well, twice here in this passage we read, the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, and then it unfolds. So let's see what happens when Elijah brings the word to a wicked king by the name of Ahab. We'll see that he was shaken, but he was not saved. Deeply shaken, genuinely shaken, but not saved. And we're going to three, draw three applications uh, from this for ourselves this afternoon. First of all, uh, when the word of the Lord came to Ahab, he was deeply and genuinely shaken to the core of his being. You can see that uh, in, in the effect that's described here when... Elijah brings the word. Now, it's a pretty terrifying word that Elijah brings too, isn't it? 
we, we, we can read there that of, of how uh, Elijah is commanded to say certain things to Ahab. And uh, the, the first of them is laid out there in verses 19 and 20. Thus saith the Lord, Has, have you killed and taken possession? And, uh, and then he's got to say to him, in the place where the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, the dogs shall lick your blood. And then a little bit later on in verses uh, 22 and following, he says, I'll make your house like the house of Jeroboam and like the house of Ahijah because you've provoked me with, to anger and made Israel to sin. He goes on, he describes what's going to happen to Jezebel. The dogs will eat Jezebel uh, at the walls of Jezreel. And then it goes on, describes what's going to happen to all his children. Uh, in the, all the generations are going to just be annihilated. Uh, so him, him that dies of Ahab in the city, the dogs will eat him that dies in the field, the fowls of the air shall eat. Ahab and his family are going to be wiped off the face of history. Now, bear in mind that this word coming from Elijah uh, echoes uh, with the same fearsome power as what, Eli uh, what Ahab has, has witnessed on Mount Carmel just so recently. Remember what happened on Mount Carmel? Elijah, commanded by the Lord, speaks. And fire descends from heaven and consumes the sacrifice, licks up all the water. And, uh, and there's such an, an incredible evidence of the, the, the power of God to perform his word that there can be no question in Ahab's mind that God can do exactly what he's threatened to do. More than that, that God will do exactly what he threatens to do. Now, if you put yourself in that sort of situation with this immediate word of God to you, just imagine what that's like. If you just imagine yourself going about in your life and all of a sudden, God sends his prophet to you with a word immediately from the Lord and he says to you, your time is up. The day of reckoning has come. You've gone too far. You've stepped over the line and now this judgment is going to descend on you and on your wife and your children. It's like the Lord saying, prepare to die, isn't it? Well, Ahab is shaken deeply and profoundly shaken. It came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he changes his conduct completely. And uh, that conduct of Ahab as he changes it is described for us here. Uh, let, have you got your Bible open? Just, just have a look at it here. It came to pass, verse 27, when Ahab heard these words that he rent his clothes. He put sackcloth upon his flesh and he fasted. And he lay in sackcloth and he went softly. Now that is a most remarkable effect, isn't it? What a change. Such a change, brethren, in the life of a king with a track record like Ahab is, is to say the least, notable. And uh, it, it's visible to the people around him and it's visible to the kingdom. It's got, it's got to be influential to everybody around him, hasn't it? And, uh, and so this is a profound, visible, evident effect uh, in Ahab's life of the word of God coming to him. And uh, you, it's not surprising that that's the case. Uh, I remember talking to an, a man who, who uh, served in World War II um, and he'd, fl he'd flown the bombers uh, that flew through all the, the flak uh, to drop bombs in Europe. And... Uh, he was one of the few that survived and came back from those raids in those bombers. 
and, uh, and, and he sat there as he was talking to us, a group of young people, the tears trickling down his cheeks. And he said to us, you know, there was nobody in those planes who professed to be an atheist. They were all praying. They were all praying. Uh, they, 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 they realized that it was only God in his providence that could possibly bring them through that alive. But that's a little bit what it's like with Ahab here. There's no, there's, no, there's no atheists when God brings home to the mind and the heart of a person that they're about to be judged, that their life is right in the balance. Ahab changed his conduct. Ahab is shaken. Ahab is moved. Ahab is touched in his mind, in his heart, and it makes a difference in his life. And uh, that, that, that difference that's made in his life is, is most remarkable. Now just imagine for a moment, if you could, that, uh, that Ahab's appearance and conduct change is, is noticed by a few people. But just imagine how, how this would have affected the land. Think, think of the, the traders, the cameleers who used to travel around with, the, with their camels from place to place. Here's, here's a group of the, 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 the cameleers have gone through Jezreel and, and they've heard reports and even perhaps seen with their own eyes the stir that's been caused by Ahab's change. I can imagine them saying uh, to the people in the village that they come to, did you hear about Ahab? And uh, you'll never believe it. Uh, Elijah told him that Jehovah had said that he was about to destroy him and his family, and Ahab took it to heart. Imagine that. He's completely changed. He's humbled himself. You can imagine the woman, women at the well who have known Ahab and his influence for so long saying, no, come on, can't be right, not Ahab. Uh, Ahab belongs to the cult of Baal. He's a worshipper of Baal. There's no way known that Ahab's going to humble himself before Jehovah. No, you've got to be kidding. And you get the response to her. Well, it seems as though Jezebel's lost her influence. Something has happened. Elijah came to him, and since Elijah talked to him, everything's changed. And uh, how do you know? You can imagine the fellow saying, well, Jacob over here has got a cousin who works in the palace's kitchen, and, and he knows exactly what's happened. Ahab, Ahab is walking around with his clothes rent, ashes on, on his head, and he's going ever so sloth, softly. He's staying in his room. It looks like he's praying. And I can imagine someone, an old fella at the well, uh, listening on and interjecting and saying, well, you know, not everything that belches in the night is a camel. <laughs> not all that shines or glitters is gold. Not everything that looks like repentance is repentance. I can imagine that. Not everything that belches in the night outside the tent is a camel. Now, that's right. Ahab is desperately trying to escape the consequences of his sin and he's doing what appears to be the works of repentance in order to escape the consequences of his sin. Now, everything he does uh, as, as he as he as he changes his contact, conduct and, and begins to go softly is an indication externally of repentance. That's what it's about. He rends his clothes. That's, by the way, that in the Old Testament times was a, was a sign or a token of extreme distress and grief. Usually in the face of death or impending death, people would rend their clothes. So real was it to Ahab the sentence of death that was sounding in his ears that he rent his clothes. Uh, then he puts on sackcloth, rough prickly material, by the way. Anyone here doesn't know what sackcloth is? Rough prickly material uh, made out of some, either plant fibres or the real stiff prickly hair of a goat or a camel. And, uh, and it's put on, it was put on so that the prickly part was touching your skin. 
sackcloth. And it was a, it was a token of, of mourning, of deep sorrow and grief and mourning and of self-effacing submission too, so that, so that there's grief and self-humiliation before God. That was a picture of that. And then the fasting that's, that's spoken of there, uh, he ceases to eat. And, and why? Uh, in order to focus the whole attention of his soul on the spiritual business of the judgment that's about to come onto him and how to escape it. And that, that, that fasting is usually attached to prayer. Prayer and fasting go together. So he's humbled himself, he's grieving, he's, he's, he's humiliating himself in the presence of God and uh, he's, he's focusing himself on the spiritual things and he lays, it says, in his bed. He doesn't just carry on. Uh, it's not business as usual. Uh, he stops everything. Everything that was, had gone on before is now stopped. And Ahab is completely focused now on his relationship with God and escaping this punishment. And he goes softly. No loud noises, no raucous commands, no laughter. Uh, everything is done uh, with a very great sensitivity. And everything, everything about the man, if you looked at him and saw how he conducted himself, is, is saying, I am humbled before God. That is what creates uh, the example in Israel, and that's what God looks down upon and says to Elijah, do you see? how Ahab humbles himself before me. It's really quite something. Now, if we were to see that sort of thing, I know people today don't brim their clothes and put ashes and sackcloth on and so forth, but if we, if we were to see someone who'd been living a most outrageously wicked life, uh, all of a sudden uh, gets serious. And, uh, and start to change and, and stop those things and turn their attention now uh, to this great problem of their guilt and judgment and the sentence that, that hangs over them announced by God. Uh, we would look at it and we would say, this is a very, very good sign. It may well be that this is repentance because these are the things that repentance brings into people's lives. But with Ahab, powerful as this was in his life, how it shook him up so deeply, it didn't, did not save him. It's like that imaginary camel driver said, not everything that belches is a camel. Not everything that does these things is repentant. And Ahab's repentance was not genuine. Let's get that clear. It was not repentance unto life that brought him uh, with a grief and hatred over his sins to turn from those sins, looking for the mercy of God and committing himself to obedience to God in all the days to come. It wasn't that. Ahab's repentance was a desire to escape the wrath of God and avoid the consequences of his sin, but not to escape the sin itself. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's because there's no mention at all in this history of Ahab removing idols from Israel or from his house or his life. There's no mention of him restoring the worship of Jehovah, tearing down the Baal, uh, uh, idols and the calves and Dan and Bethel. There's no, there's no mention of Ahab humbling himself and seeking after the blood of atonement to cleanse him from his sin and hiking himself across the hills to Jerusalem to the altar where it was the only place it could be found. Nothing at all about returning to Jehovah God through faith 
in the promise of Christ to come. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And, and what's more, uh, when, when it comes to uh, Ahab being confronted by God in Naboth's vineyard, ah, so you've killed and taken possession? Well, there's nothing in this uh, history that shows that Ahab restored the inheritance to Naboth's children, as was definitely required. And remember, if there is genuine repentance, it always brings forth its fruits. Repentance makes restitution. We can't be sorry and not seek in every way possible to us to undo the damage that's been done. So there's no mention there of Ahab restoring the vineyard. And if you were to look at chapter 28, uh, 22, verse 8, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, pretty soon, uh, as the days tick by, that you've got Ahab and uh, you've got Jehoshaphat who's come to visit him. And uh, one of God's prophets called Micaiah uh, is called on to, to prophesy about whether they should go to battle or not. And Ahab looks at this prophet of God, a faithful prophet, and, and says, I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat's horrified. He says, don't, please don't say such a thing. He's the prophet of God. You should listen to him, not hate him. So, so all these things, when you take them together, uh, they show that, that Ahab was, yes, he was profoundly shaken up in his life, but he's not saved. He's not converted. He's not brought to repentance. Uh, his repentance is a sham. It's got all the outward elements to it, but it's like a man who rends his garment when the Lord requires him to rend his heart. It's not the same thing to change your conduct as it is to repent. Repentance does not consist in external actions. It might bring forth and result in external actions, but repentance is a change of heart and attitude towards sin itself. Repentance is concerned about the sin and the offence of it before God. Repentance is not concerned, firstly, with escaping the consequences of sin. And that's really what Ahab was concerned about. Not the sin itself, but the consequences of the sin. And so he, 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 he performed all manner of external actions uh, when he had not rent his heart and he had not at all been changed. Now, now, brethren, that's a timeless lesson for us, and I'd like to draw a few lessons out of this. And the first one is, uh, we should understand, and try and do it as clearly as we possibly can, we should understand that a hypocrite can go a, a long way uh, in outward performances and duties of religion and still be unsaved. A hypocrite can go so, so far. In fact, uh, externally, uh, a hypocrite can go so far as to, as to look like a genuinely converted Christian in almost every way. Almost every way. And so, and so we, we have to be aware of that. The Lord requires, brethren, of us, and we have to take this personally. I, I'm, I, I tell you, I'm taking this personally as I, as I try and preach this. The Lord requires of us much more than just external signs that look like repentance. The Lord requires something completely different to that. He requires that we begin and, re and demand of ourselves honesty, real honesty before God. 
and Joel chapter 2, verse 13, in that prophecy of Joel, he says this to hypocritical practices of religion, people going through the motions. He says, rend your heart. Yeah, rend something. Definitely rend something. Grieve is the idea. Rend, but rend your heart, not your garments. Not just our external stuff, your heart. And turn unto the Lord your God. Really turn to him with all your heart. Why? For he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and repents him of the evil. The Lord will receive and forgive those who genuinely repent. Have you got your Bible there? Just open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 55 and and let me show you what Isaiah said. Now, by the way, Isaiah is not too far off from where Ahab was in the timeline. It's a little bit later, but uh, pretty close. Isaiah chapter 55, look at verse 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Well, that's good advice for an Ahab or for us. The sentence of death hangs over us. Judgment awaits us. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. That's while the means of grace are close to us, by the way. God is nowhere nearer than when the word is being read or preached. He's in and with that. All that's, required, that's needed there is that our, our mind, our heart, turn toward him. Humbled. Let the wicked, goes on, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. It's so amazing that he has to go on and say, my thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't behave like you do. I'll forgive you. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. So that's, that's marvellous. Now, brethren, that, that promise of God to forgive the repentant is a promise to people who, who are, are not just going through external motions of things, but are, are with their heart, their heart of heart. It's rent before the Lord. They're deeply humbled. They're, they're aware of their sins and they hate and loathe their sins. They want to be forgiven of their sins and, and have their life restored. Now, I've got a question for you. Some of us have lived a long time in the Christian life. Are you, are you walking with God with your heart rent so that nothing but the blood of Christ that cleanses you from sin, can ever satisfy you or give you peace? Do you, do you need the blood of Christ to cleanse you day by day? And do you come to the Lord as a humbled sinner, repentant, to be washed, to be washed? Don't, brethren, don't, whatever you do, settle down and be satisfied with external religion and, and, and just go through things like, and Ahab. Now, you're, you're, you and God are the ones who know what's in your heart and life. So I'll direct you to it. Let's learn the lesson. Hypocrites can go very far, but they can't go anywhere near where the Lord's taken you if you've rent your heart and sought him in that broken-hearted manner. And the second thing, uh, there, there are, and this follows on quite naturally, there are real significant non-saving effects that are worked in unregenerate people who live and die unrepentant, but there are real non-saving effects worked in them as they are under the authority and power of the word of God. Get that? 
as the Word of God, the Bible, the Scriptures, and, and, and the power and, the, and as the significance of it comes home to their minds. Unregenerate, unsaved sinners can have the most remarkable things worked in their, in their thinking and in their life. There are non-saving effects to the Word of God. Now, why is that? Let me just touch on that a bit. It's because the Word of God, brethren, is truth. And like it came to Ahab through Elijah, it came as the very truth of God and it revealed to him what God's going to do and it breaks like light into the darkness. Now, God's Word is truth and your human mind... Every human being's mind is designed by God to be the place where truth touches on and creates a response. We're rational, thinking creatures. So that when truth comes home to our minds, it rattles us. It's like it does to Ahab. It shakes us. It gets inside us. It can't be ignored. It does something to us. Now, that's right, and it's good that it should be so. It's unavoidable that it should be so. Now, the truth is, is, is in itself powerful, and it, and it can have its impress and its work even in the most wicked, hard-hearted person. Uh, even when we are spiritually hostile to the truth and would like to deny it, we can't keep it out. And, and, and so the Word of God has got this in, innate, incredible power in it to, to get below the surface and, and get towards our conscience and take a hold of us and, and ruin our peace, shake us up. We say to ourselves, now, if that's true, I'm in trouble. Now, every sinner should say that as the Word of God comes and says to, the, to us all, Look at yourself, look at what God requires of you, look at how far you shall fall short, look at your guilt, look at the judgment to come, look at, look, look at eternal death and damnation, think of hell. Now, those, those things, if they get inside us, as truth does, they'll rattle us. They'll, they'll stop us being able to sleep at night. They'll trouble our conscience. And, 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 and as a person's conscience is stirred and troubled, They'll, they'll start asking themselves, like I have, what do I need to do? Uh, and, and, and the word of God will come. Uh, and it'll answer, well, you need to, to, to become a believer. You need to repent. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do this. You need to do that. There's all sorts of things that the word of God recall, requires of you. And, and, and the person under that, under that work of the word will say to themselves, well, okay, if that's what's required, well, that's what I'll do. Here I go. I'm going to have at it. And that's the way the Word of God works on our minds. Now, that's not necessarily at all a saving work, but it's an impression very real that shakes people right up. But now, there's more. Where the Word of God comes in that way, there is what we call the common operations of the Holy Spirit that are in connection with the Word. And here is something more, where the Word of God is addressing our minds. The common operation of the Holy Spirit is such that it can take that Word and drive it deeper and deeper into the mind and the heart and the conscience, and, and through that through that word now in the hands of the Spirit and his common operations, common to believers and unbelievers alike, it can give us such profound impressions of the truth that we will tremble when you think of hell. And it can even bring through the word such delightful impressions and, and, and intellectual knowledge and awareness of the glories of heaven that, that, that you'd feel a sense of delight and joy in the very thinking about it. Common operations of the Holy Spirit upon the mind and the intellect of a rational moral creature under the influence of the truth. 
but not necessarily saving. They stop short. And such a person can have those impressions. Read Hebrews chapter 6 for this if you'd like. Such a person can have those impressions and be greatly moved to all manner of reformation externally and yet go lost. What appeared to be faith, what appeared to be repentance, when the pressure comes on or life becomes a little complex or other things get in the way and carry their hearts away, they'll leave it all behind. And it will look as if a believer has gone lost, but they were never a believer. They went far, but they didn't ever come brokenhearted to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith to receive him alone as their saviour. They stopped short of that. And if you really ask them, I believe that they would have always been able to say to you, I don't think I've ever really come home to the Lord. There are real significant but non-saving effects uh, of the word uh, on people's lives. It's interesting, uh, our confession, Larger Catechism 68, puts it this way. In answer to the question, are, are the elect only effectually called? It says, all the elect and they only are effectually called, although others may be and often are outwardly called by the ministry of the word. And some have common operation to the spirit who for their willful neglect and contempt of the grace offered to them, being justly left in their unbelief, do never truly come to Jesus Christ. And I think if we were to take that up and really think about it, what it's saying to us is, brethren, oh, oh brethren, be sure that you are in deadly earnest and serious about your own soul and its relationship to Jesus Christ and to God in him. Be deadly serious about that. Don't rest content with what may be the common operations of the Holy Spirit. And one thing, very briefly in closing. This influencing of wicked men in ungodly society like it was with Ahab, this influencing for good is an important, and indeed I'd say, a vital purpose of God with his word. It's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose of God with his word is the salvation of his elect through faith in Jesus Christ. But this influencing of wicked men is a very, very important secondary purpose. And if you ask yourself, what is it that restrains the wickedness uh, of men and women in society? Uh, it, it is in large part the word of God and its influence upon wicked men that restrains the evil. There's no such thing as common grace. It's not as if there's a benevolent love of God in the heart of God for, for all men and women and children and God's doing his best but just can't quite pull off their salvation. That's not, that's not it at all. But, but there is, under God's administration and government, a pervasive and powerful influence of the truth that restrains men and women out of self-interest because they would rather have happiness than sorrow and they'd rather have life than death. They're restrained out of self-interest, not love of God, but out of self-interest to do the good and to refrain from the evil. They would rather walk free than be thrown in jail. They would rather have a happy marriage than to have their wife leave them, so they'll do what it takes. They would rather have their children love them uh, than hate them, so that they will treat them nicely and kindly. And society then, under the influence of God's word and truth and, and good, is restrained. And good is promoted. And society is able to continue without devouring itself. It's, it's like when the word of God comes to Ahab. Now we think to ourselves, well, we've, we've had occasions where, where the word of God's been preached, perhaps even in this town, or you know of places where it's been preached, and people have heard it and they've gone away angry. 
And they've said, that preacher is making us feel as though we're not good. Uh, we don't like it. But the influence, the influence of that, as they've, as they've heard the word, the law of God and the gospel, is a profoundly powerful thing and percolates throughout the whole of their life and is used by God in his providence to govern things in such a way that they continue the way they're designed to be until the Lord returns. This too is an important work of God through his word. It's a non-saving work, but it's important. And uh, very often, I think that the church and preachers lose sight of it and don't recognise uh, that, that God is working in this way every time the word is preached. So there's so much to learn and to be encouraged in or to be reminded of uh, from this example. But for you personally this afternoon, please take home with you that point that, that uh, it, it's necessary, it's required, it's, it's important for you to be deadly earnest about your heart relationship to God. Do not content yourself with the external elements, but go all the way through them uh, to the living God himself in repentance. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we can spend thinking about these things. Uh, Lord, there's so many wonderful things tucked away in here that we could meditate on and think about. Help us, Lord, to take this message home like a package in our pocket, in our mind, and pull it out and have a think about it, to uh, unfold it again and uh, to apply it to our life. That's what we need to do by way of meditation. Meditation uh, can help us Take the word of God we've heard and chew it over and redigest it and actually apply it to ourselves. Help us, Lord. Uh, we need you to really work these things uh, in all honesty and sincerity in our hearts, uh, lest we fool ourselves. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>